Hello and thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. Uh, my name is Richard Cobden. I'm the Digital Media Officer at Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, and I'll just run you through um, a few housekeeping rules uh, just while people are still coming in. Um, tonight's talk um, will be by Louise Kenwood, who is the writer in residence at Rye Harbour Nature Reserve. Um, if you see down on the bottom bar, we have a um, question and answer button. If you have any questions, uh, if you can type them in there and hopefully at the end of the talk, we will um, have time to put those to Louise and hopefully get the answers that you're after. Um, tonight's talk is being recorded and you will be able to um, watch it again on the Trust website uh, where it will be uploaded in the next couple of days. Um, also, at the end of tonight's webinar, we will give you some more information um, about a creative writing project which Sussex Wildlife Trust is um, running in February. And that will give you a chance to put the skills that you've learned tonight to good use, hopefully. Um, we're just waiting for the last few people to keep coming in. And then we'll be able to get started. OK, I think we're about there. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Louise Kenwood, who is the writer in residence at Rye Harbour Nature Reserve, who's going to be leading this creative writing workshop. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you to Sussex Wildlife Trust for inviting me along um, today. I'm really pleased to be here um, and I have got some fantastic writing to share with you. Um, um, and I hope you're inspired to write your own stories about connections with nature and encounters with wildlife. Um, so before I dive in, I want to thank you for coming, for tuning in um, and for wanting to write. So all you need is a pen and paper or keyboard and screen or whatever you need to record your thoughts and ideas during our session this evening. Um, so whether you're whether writing is something you're trying for the first time or if you've an established writing practice, I hope that this session brings something for you. Um, so pull up your chair in my virtual kitchen. Um, there's a big pot of tea in the middle. The fires are light. Um, leave the day at the door and we shall crack on. Um, so to start with, I want to read you a short piece um, about how we might go about spending time outdoors uh, with a section from Helen MacDonald's Fest for Flights. So um, this is her new, newest book, although it's not very new anymore. Um, and it's a collection of essays that explore what the authors learned from spending time in nature. Um, so at the top of the back cover, it reads, animals don't exist to teach us things, but that is what they've always done. And most of what they teach us is what we think we know about ourselves. Um, so I hope that sets a nice um, scene for this evening's session. Um, and so in this piece, it's the beginning of um, her essay, Hiding, um, and it uh, gently asks questions that we might not give second thought to, um, and that what a lot of great nature writers are doing is questioning who we are in relation to nature, uh, making us think again about our own responsibilities, and our own existence as a part of nature rather than something other than us. Okay. Um, so Richard, if you can pull up the um, extract of Hiding by Helen MacDonald, that would be fantastic. And then anyone that wants to read along can do that. Great. A wildlife hide, a building whose purpose is to make one disappear. This one is a rustic wooden box with bench seats and narrow slits along one side. Walking up to it, it looks almost exactly like a small weather-beaten garden shed. I've made myself disappear in hides for as long as I can remember. Structures like it are found in nature reserves all over the world, and they seem as natural a part of these places as trees and open water. 
Even so, a familiar, nervous apprehension flares up as I reach for the door. So I pause for a few seconds before opening it. Inside, the air is hot and dark and smells of dust and creosote. There's no one else here. I swing my legs over the bench seat and lower the wooden window blind to create a bright rectangle in the darkness. As my eyes adjust, the space before me re resolves into a shallow lagoon under streets of cumulus clouds. Almost automatically, I scan the scene with binoculars, ticking off species, three shoveler ducks, two little egrets, a common tern. But my mind is elsewhere, puzzling over that odd sense of apprehension, trying to work out what causes it. Wildlife hides are not innocent of history, they evolved from photographic blinds, which in turn were based on structures designed to put people closer to animals in order to kill them. Duck blinds, deer stands, tree platforms for shooting big cats. Hunting has shaped modern nature appreciation in myriad unacknowledged ways, including the tactics used to bring animals into view. As hunters bait deer and decoy ducks, so preserve managers create shallow feeding pools that concentrate wading birds near hides or set up feeding stations for wary nocturnal mammals. In the highlands of Scotland, one celebrated hide gives visitors a 95% chance of seeing rare pine martins. Lithe arboreal predators munching on piles of peanuts. What you see from hides is supposed to be true reality. That is, wild animals behaving perfectly naturally because they do not know they're being observed. But the side effect of turning yourself into a pair of eyes in a darkened box is to distance you from the all-encompassing landscape around the hide. In so doing, reinforcing a divide between human and natural worlds, encouraging us to feel that animals and plants should be looked at, never touched. Sometimes the window in front of me resembles nothing so much as a television screen. Okay. Thank you, Richard. You can pull that down again now. Uh, so this sets up Helen's time spent in a hide, um, waiting to see something. So she raises some interesting questions about how we engage with the natural world and the historical context of this, and how we often regard nature as something separate to ourselves. So she uses really strong descriptions about her environment too. So you're sat on that bench with her, um, experiencing the heat and the smell of creosote. Um, and as she's noticing her actions, um, as she's more consciously paying attention to her surroundings, we see that she brings in other experiences and knowledge um, into the wider context as showing us where she is in the hide and spotting little egrets and then taking us up to Scotland to see pine martins. So we don't all or always have access to these kinds of sites, although I know there's a lot at Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, so for some of us, this might be really familiar um, these kind of structures in the landscape. Um, for others, it might be that our more regular encounters with um, wildlife or nature are sat on a park bench, feeding the ducks, um, a paddle on the beach, um, or watching out your window, or even noticing the spider crawling up the wall. So for our first writing exercise, um, it'll be a free write, so just five minutes um, just to write, to, um, to start to move the words. Um, so I want to offer a prompt of having to think about a particular moment or encounter that you've had. Um, and so to get those words moving, we'll spend five minutes writing about this moment or encounter that you bring to mind. Um, so go with your first instinct. It can be small or large, fleeting, impressive or very ordinary. It might be about a plant, an animal or a landscape or something that you've particularly noticed. Um, or it might be something that you've just missed, the deer running back into the woods or the um, indication that a creature had been there spotting fresh tracks in the mud or finding a nest. So draw on your knowledge and experience of places you visit. Remember only you can write from your perspective. What you see and hear and think and feel is key. Um, and trust yourself, follow those footpaths of curiosity and see where they take you. Um, 
so I shall stop talking and let you um, get to it. Try to let your body do the work, keep moving your hand across the page and just keep going. And this is those lovely moments where your subconscious can create things that you wouldn't imagine when you tried to think about it. So give it the space to allow whatever comes to the page. Use all your senses. Um, we often rely on the visual. So remember the smells and tastes and textures and sounds as you write. Right, I shall go and I shall give us all five minutes to write. So go.
Okay. So if you come to the end of your line or the end of your thought, something to come back to. Um, how did you get on? Fantastic start to get those words on the page um, and to start to um, get something down. So um, thinking about our own um, writing practice. So we all have our own unique perspective on the world and our own particular voice. So looking at different books for this evening, I was reminded of a book that I used when I was a, um, a student doing my art degree, which is called Art and Fear. Um, and something that um, is equally applicable to other creative endeavors, I think. So one of the things it reminded me of is that we, we notice what we notice um, and that this is our strength and to play to our strengths. So we move through the world in our own unique ways and the skill is to pay attention to the things that we, we notice. It's really easy to take things for granted and for the familiar to become invisible. So it can become a real skill to attune to that. So whether it's uh, sitting with a sketchbook or a notebook, um, it, it's those kind of observational skills. Um, so for example, I live with chronic illness. So this means that there's times when I'm slower than others, when I've spent long periods of time um, where I can't get out and I can't go walking. Um, and it's these times that have taught me to appreciate the smaller things. Um, so for a long time, it was noticing the shadows that moved across the room as the sun set. And that was my reference to the, the changing of, of time during the day um, and the outside world coming into, coming into the flat. Um, and as I started to leave the house, I walked very slowly. And this meant that I noticed the self-seeded flowers in the pavements and all the things that we walk past on our way somewhere else were in a hurry. So I don't know if you saw David Attenborough at the weekend, the new Green Planet on Sunday, um, who was talking about um, plants that find themselves in, in most inhospitable places um, and plants that we might refer to as weeds. And he described them as pioneer plants, which I thought was rather wonderful. Um, and kind of the the ability to grow in, in most unlikely places. Um, I have all renewed respect for these tiny things. Um, so whatever kind of adventure you're able to make, whatever extent of your travels, each encounter can be worthy of writing about. Um, again, it's about noticing, looking and listening and developing that knowledge of place and experience. So for the next um, piece of work I want to share is from um, a poet called Elizabeth Jane Burnett. So she has a collection of C um, published by Pend in the Margins and this charts her encounters with wildlife um, while swimming on the south coast of Devon. So I've included this one because it's a stunning poem but it gives a very different feeling to um, Helen MacDonald's piece um, and it feels like a kind of immersion in itself. So Richard, if you can pull up Sea Mouse for us, that would be great. And you can read along. Sea Mouse. Stomach of fur, coughed up at low tide, stranded. Snowfall of fur, dust in the mouth, sanded. Out of this, worms fall soft as whispers, coiling into fawning Aphrodite, and out of her hair come the corpses of a swallowed sea. Let's give you a moment. So I haven't ever encountered a sea mouse, but having seen photographs, this poem captures exactly how I imagine the sea mouse to look and feel um, if I was to find one on the beach washed up. So for those that don't know, a sea mouse is a marine worm and it's covered in bristles um, and shimmers with blue, green and gold at the edges. Um, and it's um, about 10, 15 centimetres in length um, and predates small crabs and other worms on the seabed. But like anything else that lives in the sea, we mostly only encounter it when it's been washed up. So where Helen MacDonald's piece has lots of sensory detail of smell and temperature and centres 
the narrator, she pulls us in. Um, Elizabeth Jane Burnett's poem strips out a lot of that and gives a fantastic sense of texture and a real essence of sea mouse. Uh, sea mouse also considers the journey the creature's been on for it to, to wash up dead. Um, and both writers are concerned with the environment and how poetry can raise consciousness by bringing the effect of climate change or pollution to life. And I think this is one of the really powerful things that we can do as writers. So I shall read this um, again and uh, we'll have another uh, short time to, to write. Sea mouse. Stomach of fur, coughed up at low tide, stranded. Snowfall of fur, dust in the mouth, sanded. Out of this, worms fall soft as whispers, coiling into fawning Aphrodite. And out of her hair come the corpses of a swallowed sea. So we can leave that up for the time being, and I invite you to write about a particular animal or insect, plant or tree, and it might be the um, that relates to the piece of writing you've already done um, in the free write, or it might be something else. Um, it could be something you've seen stranded, like Elizabeth Jane Burnett, or something you see all the time. Uh, what captures that sense of the moment? Are there particular words or metaphors that can capture more of the descriptions than, than you might normally use? Um, and think again about the sensory elements, the textures, the way the light is cast, the sounds you can hear, every last detail that you can recall, how to, how to get it um, all into kind of compact, um, as uh, Burnett has done here. How, how did it make you feel? Can you capture something of it as you describe this creature or plant to distill the encounter to its most elemental? What were the key aspects for you if you boil it right down? What's most important? What captures its essence? Um, so we'll have seven minutes now to, um, to write. Um, and just referencing the, the Aphrodite in, at the end of the poem. Um, so it, it references the sea mouse scientific name, uh, which is named after the Greek god of love. And it feels like a real love letter to this mangled creature that she's found on the beach. So I invite you to write a, a love letter or, or some other um, way of capturing the essence of your, your chosen um, subject. So we'll have seven minutes, which is a little bit longer, um, and I shall see you after that.
Okay. Thank you, Richard. You can bring that down there. Okay. So finish any last sentences or ideas, um, or by all means, carry on writing if you're now immersed in something and you're really enjoying it. Um, but for our third and final piece, um, I wanted to share another poem. Um, and it's, again, a piece of writing that relates back to Helena MacDonald's Heidi that I read at the start. So this is from um, Polly Atkins' new um, poetry collection, Much With Body. Um, and it looks at uh, encounter. So Hunting the Stag looks at a time when we're watching or waiting. And I think it gives a great context in looking at the space around the encounters we have or the absence that we might experience in willing something to view. Um, and like um, Helen MacDonald's piece around the, the history of the hides, it's uh, subverting that notion of, of hunting for the, for the reader. So Richard, if you can pull up the third, the third piece, Hunting the Stag, and you can read along with me. The stag doesn't visit because you want him to. It doesn't work like that. He doesn't materialize when you go out to look for him with the good camera this time, coiled around your neck and your sheepskin hat with the ears flaps on. He doesn't trot down from the hill to greet you, tamed by your need. He has his own matters to attend to. What did you expect? You know what you become when you're like this. Too much, too much. Scanning for movement in the undergrowth, beady and atavistic. When you press your palm on the stone gate post and wish your wish is selfish. The heron passes asking, what are you missing when you only look for big things? A selfish wish never comes good. He is higher than you can walk today or deeper. You cannot make him come to you. Not the great stag with his rustling mane not even the small roe with his sapling antlers. He will be standing in the shadow of the side street when you lock up the shop. He will be standing in the shadow of the house when you stay out too long, talking on the path through the trees about loss, till the fells dissolve into dusk and push you down to him. You will feel him before you hear him, you will hear him before you see him. He will seem to step out of the walls of your house or through them. You will think he is waiting for you, but you are incidental. You will go to a place you haven't worked for years, wade into the lake, bristling as swans ripple out from his image. Don't want so much. Come down from the woods. Empty your pockets of pine cones and sticks. Light the fire. It doesn't work like that. Light the candles. Nothing does. So I adore this poem um, and it captures so much of the, the waiting as much as the encounter and draws on the memory of the stag from previous encounters. And it great. Um, and the hope for future ones. So even the, the reference to taking the good camera out, the expectations that we have, and the reminder of the lack of control that we have, the frustrations and disappointment, but the possibility of encounter is held and the writing creates another space where the writer holds all these previous experiences and the knowledge gained while learning is all packed in there. Um, and learning not for the first time to just let go and to allow things their own space. So I shall read the, the poem again for you. Um, I think sometimes the second, second reading, it, it has another, another layer of meaning and then we'll have a, another chance to write. Hunting the stag. 
The stag doesn't visit because you want him to. It doesn't work like that. He doesn't materialize when you go out to look for him with the good camera this time coiled around your neck and your sheepskin hat with the ears flaps on. He does not trot down from the hill to greet you, tamed by your need. He has his own matters to attend to. What did you expect? You know what you become when you're like this. Too much. Too much. Scanning for movement in the undergrowth, beady and atavistic. When you press your palm on the stone gate post and wish your wish is selfish. The heron passes, asking, what are you missing when you only look for big things? A selfish wish never comes good. He is higher than you can walk today, or deeper. You cannot make him come to you. Not the great stag with his rustling mane, not even the small roe with his sapling antlers. He will be standing in the shadow of the side street when you lock up the shop. He will be standing in the shadow of the house when you stay out too long, talking on the path through the trees about loss till the fells dissolve into dusk and push you down to him. You will feel him before you hear him. You will hear him before you see him. He will seem to step out of the walls of your house or through them. You will think he is waiting for you but you are incidental. He will go to a place you haven't worked for years, wading into the lake, bristling as swans ripple out from his image. Don't want so much. Come down from the woods, empty your pockets of pine cones and sticks, light the fire. It doesn't work like that. Light the candles, nothing does. Okay, thanks Richard, you can take that down now. So I hoped you loved that as much as I did. Um, so for our last exercise, um, we've slightly longer again, and I want you to think about what you leave out as much as you include. So using absence, that sense of waiting, of anticipation, that can emphasise those moments of presence, even if only fleeting, especially if only fleeting. And consider other polarities of visibility and invisibility, the light and shade that emphasises different aspects, as with loss and hope, show one and the other becomes more colourful. And layer in your own emotional responses, memories and hopes, um, and kind of make the, your words kind of enriched with, with, with all those experiences and memories. So we've uh, 12 minutes 12 minutes, 10 minutes, um, just to make sure we have a few, a few minutes left for questions. Um, so we'll come back at 20 past eight. Okay, thank you.
Okay, we'll come to the end of that last sentence or those last last thoughts. Um, and I hope that the um, piece of writing that you can come back to um, and that they've prompted new new thoughts or new pieces for you. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed the, the writing. Um, so just to finish off coming back to Helen MacDonald's piece, so her observation about how we interact and engage with the natural world. And for some of us, watching is a really valid way of connecting. Um, and I know Sussex Wildlife Trust have lots of different opportunities and ways of, of connecting um, out and about and volunteering or getting involved in different projects. Um, but certainly when I've not been able to, to um, go out walking or, or be any more involved, I've really enjoyed finding um, webcams that allow me to travel to far flung places while I'm resting at home. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of us found um, through lockdown and through the pandemic is finding different ways of connecting with nature or noticing different things. Um, so I've, I've got some links that Richard's going to send out um, in an email at the end of this session with um, different ways of, of being able to connect with different places. So there's a um, webcam in, well, all, around, all over the world, but there's one I like the little penguins in Australia um, and the Nautilus um, deep sea research sub, um, which is amazing. So again, these are all very valid ways of um, watching and, and engaging. Um, so yes, I think that's everything I wanted to um, to say. Um, Richard, how are we doing? Hi Louise, thank you. That was that was really really inspiring and some um, lovely lovely words there. Oh cool, excellent. That was very good. Um, we've had a couple of questions in. Um, one of them is about the sea mouse, oh. um, which was um, Lisa asking, "Is it rare for a sea mouse to show up on the shore?" Um, which uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, they um, live um, sort of out out in the deep water, and it tends to be either at a very low tide or when there's been a storm that they tend to wash up on the beach. Um, uh, Barry Yates, who is the reserve manager for Rye Harbour Nature Reserve, managed to get some film of one um, about a year ago. So I will see if I can dig that out. And I'll put that up on our um, on the Sussex Wildlife Trust Twitter feed, and you can have a look at look at um, a sea mouse in action there. Oh, that's fantastic! I look forward to that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, and the other question we have, which is quite a good one, is how does one get a job as a writer in residence? <laughs> that's an excellent question. <laughs> I'm not sure even I can answer. Um, uh no i mean i think um a lot of it is about sort of being in touch with different projects so so the residency at rye um is part of a heritage lottery fund project um so it was one that i managed to get involved in um just at the outset because there was delays and so on and so the person that set it up sadly wasn't able to continue so it was um partly being in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm sure there are different places these kind of opportunities crop up, but I'm not sure I'm the best person to advise. Um, certainly local writing organisations, uh, depending on where you are. So for me, it's New Writing South. Um, so again, any kind of general um, writing advice or information and in terms of um, those kind of career opportunities, I would suggest they, so I know there's new, um, new writing North and there's there's others around the country um, in the UK. So certainly look, look those up and, and connect with those. Um, and aside from that, I mean, a lot of the, I've just, um, I'm starting another project, um, which I wanted to mention called Moving Mountains, which is about to launch soon. And so a lot of the work I do, I, um, 
uh, I, I set up the project myself and then go and get funding. Um, and so then it's kind of um, created that way rather than, I think, applying for, for jobs, although those jobs are there. I've seen lots of um, like artist um, in residences as well. And AN network is good for that. Um, yes, I'm not sure I could ramble on about lots of different ways and things, but um, yes, if there's a particular, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can say anything else rather than kind of rattling on. Yeah, excellent. I hope that gives you a pointer at least. Definitely. Um, we've probably got time for a few more quick questions. Um, Jilly asks, when you go out into nature, Louise, do you take a notebook with you or do you just absorb what's around you or um, how would you approach that? That's a good question. Um, so I've like all of us, I think, I've always got my phone. I'm usually uh, kind of take photographs. And one of the things that I really enjoy doing is, is kind of noticing those small things and those small changes. Um, and photography kind of allows you to do that in the, through a kind of durational period of time. Um, so yes, I do, um, I do go out with a notebook, but normally it's, a, a kind of after I've come back and I'll sit or or something will brew and it will be kind of weeks or months in gestation rather than kind of watching something and being inspired to write there and then um, I'm not very good at that it, it's it's kind of more of a slow burn um, and a process of researching and, and experiencing and um, yeah excellent um Kimberly asks a good question now. I suspect this could probably be another webinar all, all by itself. Um, how do you start writing a piece of creative nature writing and what, what would be a summary of your process? Um, that is a good question. And I think different people do it in lots of different ways. And I hope kind of this evening, there's a selection of just three people that um, work in, in very different ways to each other um, and that makes it such a, a rich and exciting um, kind of field so there's more kind of journalistic um, approaches um, a kind of scientific um, looking at um, to yes so the more um, fact-based to more creative writing and I think that kind of somewhere in, in the middle um I'm wondering where I'm going with this so a lot of my process is also around ritual and repetition so a piece um I had a piece in there's a fantastic anthology called Women on Nature that was edited by Catherine Norbury and came out last week which wasn't on the list um but I probably should have added it so that was a piece that came from Again, as I was um, beginning to recover from a long period of illness, I went to the sea when I lived by the beach and it was only a short walk. And I took a photograph every day and that was like a diary entry. Um, and from there, I took a, um, a jam jar with me and I, I caught a wave. So I went every day and it was kind of my ritual. And that was my, um, my target for the day was to get to the beach um, and the jar of seawater was the evidence that I'd made it so it was a kind of cumulative diary um, and then the writing came it started as notes so recording what the weather was and what the temperature was and in a kind of fairly rudimentary way um, and it sort of developed into um, wove into other experiences I'd had of the sea um, and I guess thinking of like Helen Macdonald's piece, she she takes us up to Scotland from the hide that she's in um, elsewhere. So again, I'm sorry, it's not a straightforward question. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm conscious of time, so I, I won't keep um, yeah, keep sure. talking. But um, yes, I hope it gives you a bit of an idea. Um, and we've got time probably for one more. So uh, a couple of people have asked, if we're going to do any more creative writing workshops. Um, nothing is confirmed yet, but I would say watch this space. Hopefully there will be something on, on the horizon. Um, and Anne asks, um, with 
your residency at Rye Harbour, are you hoping to run some in-person workshops? Absolutely. Um, yes. Uh, so we've had some before um, Christmas and then the last um, group we sadly had to cancel. Um, yeah, because uh, Omicron figures were just too too high to kind of risk the safety of participants and also, um, yeah, facilitator. So they're um, linking in with um, the Discovery Centre at Rye Harbour. So there's nothing set up at the moment, but, but that will start again. And in the interim, in the absence of being able to do um, anything very extensive, I've set up a, a newsletter, so on MailChimp, um, which again, there'll be a link from Richard's email. So if you wanted to, um, to kind of join again in a virtual space, then I'll send out a, um, a kind of series of writing prompts and links to writing um, each month through through the year that links to the time of year and, and Rye Harbour in some way, so that there's a way of connecting with me, even if you're not able to get to Rye. Um, but yes, there, there will hopefully be in-person sessions soon as well. Excellent. Well, thank you ever so much, Louise. Um, uh, from all the comments flooding in, um, everyone's had a really inspiring evening. So that's been uh, oh, brilliant. I'm so pleased. It's so um, <laughs> hard not being able to see, yes. yes, to see anyone or to hear anyone. So I'm yeah. really grateful. So, so um, again, you're just, you'll just have to imagine hundreds of people giving you a big round. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, I hope to, to see you again soon. Um, just to just to say that um, all the links and the resources that Louise mentioned, um, they'll be available uh, once we finish the webinar. You'll be taken to a page on our website, which um, you can download a um, list of those resources from that page there. Um, there's also an opportunity to make a donation if you would like. And of course, if you're not a member of the Wildlife Trust, there's a chance to join Sussex Wildlife Trust. We would love to have you as members. Um, the last thing I've got to do is briefly mention um, Sussex Wildlife Trust is running a creative writing project. Um, we started last year to celebrate our 60th anniversary and we had a very good response to that so we're running a similar project this year um, it's based around the, the theme of emergence and uh, we're asking people if they want to submit um, either 14 lines of poetry or 150 words of micro fiction um, the closing date for that is the 28th of February so you've got a bit of time to get that together and then from those, our favourite ones will be put together in a, into a small publication. Um, it's open to um, people of all ages and all abilities. Um, if you're under 16, it'd be great if you could just put your age on there, um, just so we know that. So all that information is on the Trust's um, website. It's called Emergence and Creative Writing project so hopefully you'll all be inspired from what you've heard tonight and um, I look forward to seeing your entries from that so thank you everybody who's attended tonight um, and of course thanks to Louise for giving such a great talk tonight that's brilliant good night everybody <laughs>